Subscribe to The Leader to get all of the Evening Standard's news, commentary and analysis every day at 4pm. Now, from The Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. MI6 is lowering its minimum recruitment age to 18. The big challenge facing MI6 uh, currently is technology and how fast technology is developing. Our deputy political editor Nicholas Cecil on his exclusive story, Why Does the Spy Agency Need Teenagers? Also, thieves are recruited back in their home country put on a flight to the UK, they'll meet a contact who gives them a car and multiple phones, and then they will target these areas, which are all pre-selected targets. Liam Coleman on the Evening Standards investigation into gangs from Chile coming to the UK to break into wealthy people's homes. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is the leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comet. In a moment, the young minds helping the UK spies. This is not your father's spy agency. Today's MI6 exists in a dizzying world of fast-paced tech evolution and global opponents who don't care what university you went to. This is the era of bedroom hackers and social media influencers, a time when Twitter bots can, allegedly, influence elections. The UK's intelligence service knows it needs to get smarter and it needs to get younger. The Evening Standards revealed MI6 is lowering its recruitment age to 18 years old, and the editorial column thinks it's a good idea. MI6's aim is to tap in earlier to a new generation of young people who have grown up with technology at the centre of their lives. The agency hopes these teenage recruits can bring new skills and insights and help it keep ahead of its targets. None of the planned teenage recruits will join as spies in the traditional sense, although some could eventually progress to become fully-fledged intelligence officers later. Instead, they will start in roles such as tech, business support and human resources. But while this might sound less glamorous, it also exposes the truth that in today's world, the effectiveness of our intelligence agencies depends as heavily on backroom talent as it does on the more conventional roles. What is also important about today's shift in approach in MI6 is the connected desire to widen further the social mix of its recruits and to dispel what it insists is the misplaced notion that its jobs are only open to those with an Oxbridge education who get an old-style tap on the shoulder. Our deputy political editor, Nicholas Cecil, joins me from an undisclosed location. Nicholas, why does MI6 need teenagers? The big challenge facing MI6 uh, currently is technology and how fast technology is developing. So that they're, they're keen very much to recruit a, a younger generation um, to the service. This is partly because the younger people tend to live technology, so they don't have to learn it like older generations do. So it comes naturally to them. And you went to an event where MI6 had invited uh, some young people to come along and kind of get a, a flavour, a taste of what it is to work for the spy agency. What happened? Who was there and what happened? Yes, MI6 invited 30 teenagers from inner London through a very good charity called the Big Kid Foundation. So, so these teenagers were invited to the Intelligence Services Vauxhall Cross headquarters. And this was part of a recruitment effort to, to broaden the social backgrounds of people that they recruit from. What sort of activities were they getting up to? They, they, they took part in one spy test game where they had to try and contact people linked to an um, arms dealer codenamed Beetlejuice. And what was very interesting is how they responded, is they immediately thought of tech solutions. So some of their thoughts were about 
the psychology of approaching people, but, but other people came up with ideas about finding people's IP addresses and so on to, to get to them online or through other technological means. So one thing that MI6, are, I, I think, are keen to emphasise is that these people will not be given licences to kill and sent off across the world to, to fight enemies in, in mortal danger. These are more mundane positions within the agency, aren't they? Yes, yeah, so they're, they're still very important jobs, uh, often sort of support jobs. But certainly Sir Alex Younger, the, the, the head of MI6, was very keen to explain to these teenagers that... MI6 officers do not have a license to kill, that they uh, ab abide by the law, and also they adhere to British values. But then if you showed the appropriate skills, values and attitude, you could apply to be an intelligence officer, more directly combating the threats from hostile states, terror groups and major crime gangs. It's kind of a, a first foot through the door, really, isn't it? And there's uh, good salaries with these. Business support officers starting at just over £29,000. That would be nice if you're 18, wouldn't it? Yes, no, that, that's a very good starting salary. And certainly f for that job, which is currently being, being advertised, you could be part of a, a spying team doing the admin work for, for it. So even though you're not immediately on the front line, you still would, I think, very much feel part of the organisation. So, Nick, of the teenagers who were at this event, what kind of things were they saying to you? Were they surprised at how open MI6 is? The, 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 they were surprised. Um, and most of them, if not all of them, only realised that they were going to MI6 when their minibuses pulled, out, pulled up outside the security gates. And speaking to some of them afterwards, they were saying it's a reality check. We didn't realise these jobs were available. And what one in particular was quite interesting. He said, um, I didn't realise all these jobs were just one click away. So not only is it the geographical proximity of MI6 to many of, for, for where these people live, but also they, again, look, look at things online through technology. And so it, it's a click rather than a postal application that they would consider. Next. It's a constant game of cat and mouse. These criminals have a lot of money and they will find new ways to be able to get people to come to the UK to carry out the burglaries to target the homes. Liam Coleman's been investigating how criminals are able to fly into the UK from Chile. The Chilean passport is the most widely accepted in Latin America. It gives holders visa-free travel to 174 countries, including the UK. Last October, it was used by two men to enter the country, break into celebrity chef Marcus Whaling's London home and steal a haul worth around £33,000. They've been jailed along with two accomplices, but the Evening Standards teamed up with Chilean magazine Revista Capital to investigate how gangs from that country are targeting Britain and how they get in. Liam Coleman's been working on the story. Liam, the idea of burglars plotting London raids from Chile sounds incredible. How does that work? Thieves are recruited back in their home country, put on a flight to the UK, where they, once they arrive over here, they'll, they'll meet a contact who gives them a car and, and, and multiple phones. And then they will target these areas, which are all pre-selected targets, which you know, are sometimes we understand have been marked up by using you know, spray paint to spray an orange dot on a house or a, a certain number that will you know, alert thieves to, to say, look, this house is you know, it's empty, there's, there's no one here, there's, this is how you know, this should be one that you should be going to. They'll also then be told how they can be security alarms, where the best place to enter property is for and where to, you know, where to hunt for valuables. There'll be affluent families that maybe fly away on holiday for long periods of the year. There'll be, you know, there was in one particular instance where I spoke to someone who had been a dog sitter at, at a house in Wimbledon. And basically she'd taken the dogs out and came back an hour or so later um, and she'd found that the safe from the house had been ripped out. You know, that, that these burglars had gained entry through the first floor because they knew that 
that was the way to beat the security system. Liam, the Marcus Waring case has really highlighted what's been happening. Four people have now been convicted. What do we know now about that case? All four of them um, were wanted known criminals back in Chile, where they had came from. Over a, a number of different serious offences, in particular, one of the members, uh, Danko Carvajal, Carvajal Donaire, um, he had four outstanding arrest warrants. He was detained early last year in Spain for using a false passport. And he was arrested in Italy a few weeks later and deported back to Chile. George Rojas, um, he was deported from the US last March, denied entry to Germany a month later. Um, but despite this, those, both those men, along with their accomplices, um, Nicholas Portilla Astorga and Claudio Donoso, um, they were all allowed to come into the UK um, and they were all allowed to, to carry out this burglary. Um, Quite interestingly as well, when Cavallo Donaire um, arrived in the UK in October before the break-in, despite having this number of outstanding arrest warrants um, for crimes including robbery and gun possession, he was also using identity documents pretending to be his brother Jordan. These four men all very well known to police forces outside of the UK um, and despite that were still able to attain these tourist visas which ultimately led to the £33,000 raid on Mr Waring's home in Wimbledon. What did the UK Border Force tell you about efforts to stop them? So I spoke to Tony Smith, um, who is the former Director General of UK Border Force. And what he explained to me is that at the moment, there is a number of different things going on in a, in a post-Brexit era. Um, they are to try and crack down on, on stopping these criminals being able to, to enter our country. One of those things in particular is called uh, ETA, um, to bring in electronic travel authorizations, which is similar to what they have over in the US and Canada, um, where before anyone will get on a plane who's seeking a visa, um, further government checks will be carried out to find out whether these guys have got you know, a criminal history, a general background check, which will prevent them. And if there's anything that flags up that would you know, alert authorities to tell them that they, they shouldn't be in our country, then action will be taken and they won't even be able to get on that plane in the first place. Um, and another thing that um, Mr Smith actually quite interestingly talked and spoke to me about was the use of EU ID cards. He said that these are far easier to be able to forge, far easier to make copies of than our biometric passports at the moment. So he said that another thing that is, is basically banning the use of these EU ID cards. Likewise, we'll, we'll stop these tourist burglars hopefully coming into the country through that way. He said, essentially, you know, it's a constant game of cat and mouse. These criminals have a lot of money in, in some instances, you know, the ringleaders of these gangs in, in America, and, and they will find new ways to be able to get people to come to the UK and get them into the country to carry out the burglaries to target the homes. And that's The Leader. You can subscribe through your podcast provider and get in touch with us on social media using the hashtag TheLeaderPodcast. We're back on Monday at 4pm. <laughs>